Welcome to the Route Consultant webinar on the waste industry. My name is Josh Gregory. I am the Vice President of Education here at Route Consultant. So if you've never been to one of these before, or if you're still kind of warming up to this new industry, really what these webinars are for is for you to learn about this space, ask any questions that you have while you're here. And then if you do decide that it's something interesting for you, we want to help you find ways to accelerate that journey and, and be as successful as you can. Because ultimately, that's our goal is that as we're bringing you these new opportunities, we want to make sure that you can step into them with confidence and really be successful once you take over. Now, if you are here live, if you're on one of these webinars live, uh, we will have a Q&A at the end. And so if there are any questions that you have, whether it's something that we talk about today or anything you have on this industry as a whole, Tommy and I will be there to answer them. And so just my, my ask of you is that if you do have those questions, put them in the Q&A button at the bottom of the window. If you put it in the chat, if you put it in, uh, if you raise your hand and try to get my attention that way, I'm not going to see it. So if you do have questions that you want to answer, want us to answer, make sure you put it in the Q&A at the bottom. Now, so the way it works, like I said, we'll do the Q&A at the end. First, we've got some content. So today, what we want to focus on are just kind of the pros and cons of a few different aspects of the waste industry, really to help everyone have a good understanding of, you know, the good and the bad of a bunch of different aspects. So uh, we've brought Tommy Tubriville back on, who has run these businesses. He has analyzed them and optimized them for decades. So Tommy, if you want to go ahead and jump on and say hello, then we'll get started. Good afternoon. Look forward to our discussion this afternoon. Perfect. Thanks. Good to have you back, Tommy. So, uh, you know, I, I just want to kind of break it down in, into a few different areas. And, and if you could just kind of give your thoughts, you know, what are the pros? What are the cons on each aspect of, of the various parts of the waste industry? So just first off, you know, at, at a kind of macro level, what are the pros and cons uh, of being a part of the waste industry, you know, for the economy? Like, what are the things to think through there? Yeah, it, one of the pros definitely of the waste industry is it is recession proof because, again, everybody generates waste. So if there is a recession, waste still continues. People have to get rid of it. So it is recession proof. On, on the con side, really, the only thing I can think of is it is not inflation proof. However, with that, there, there are things you can do with your agreements. The great thing about these is, is uh, you know, in your agreements with fuel rates and things of that sort, that you, you are able to adjust your rates uh, based on what's going on if there is inflation. Yeah, and I think that's a, a, an important point. Something that you, if you've been a part of the FedEx industry or something similar to that for a while, you may not be used to the idea that, hey, you know, if, if rates in the economy go up, I can just adjust them for myself and what I'm charging. On the FedEx side, you only get to negotiate once a year. You can apply for renegotiation. You don't always get that opportunity. Uh, Amazon, you don't either. So, uh, the you know, that's something that sometimes we miss is that once you control more of this revenue stream, you also get to control the rates that you are charging. Uh, so it, it should, it, it makes a lot of sense to anyone who's run, you know, some of a, a, the normal type of businesses where you can control your rates. But coming from a world where a lot of those are locked by that large customer, this is new in the waste side. And, and it's something you should be considering because yes, you get to, you get the pro of always, everybody needs to get rid of trash. <laughs> so there's the pro there that's, that it's, it's recession proof. It's always going to be a benefit, but there's just this, the, you know, as inflation happens, you can make your rates adjust as well. So, Okay, so let's go to the, the kind of the next side. So talk to me about the revenue model a little bit. You know, what are the good and the bad? What, what should be, people should be thinking about when it comes to the, the revenue side of this equation? Yeah, so on the revenue side, again, the majority of your customers, it is a monthly service fee. So it's a flat fee. So a huge pro in the waste industry is your revenue is consistent. You don't have a lot of seasonality ups and downs. I mean, it's really based on the customers you have. And so that determines that. The, the other great thing about the revenue as we were just speaking of is you set the rates. There's nobody telling you, here's, here's the rates you've got to charge for, for this service. And also, as we spoke about, rate adjustments in this industry are common. So people are accustomed to annual increases. Should something go on, you know, they're... They're very accustomed to that. And then I, I guess the one other pro from the revenue side is your growth is not limited. 
So you had the opportunity to determine, you know, where you grow, how big you grow, what area you grow. So you really have a lot of say in your revenue, the quality of the revenue and where it's coming from. From, from a con side, I mean, the one thing you don't have a lot of control of when you're talking about revenue and pricing is the disposal cost. But, you know, the, the one thing about that is disposal cost is consistent. So all your competition is dealing with the same thing. So although it is a big chunk of your overall expenses, everybody else has the same thing. So it's not uh, it's not something somebody else can have a huge advantage over you. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's fair. It's, it's a, a con of the industry, but no individual person has a ton of advantage there. Um, now, tell me on, on the if you have something that's a, a contract with the city, uh, do you still get to set the rates or does the city dictate the rates? Well, in your agreement, most of those are, are you know, bids yep. and that's how you would end up getting it. So the rates are set, but almost every one of those has a, adjustments very specifically to two areas. One is according to the CPI, uh, and, and again, there's a lot of different CPI formulas out there. So, you know, just be aware of that. And then the other is basically for fuel. So as those two things happen, if you if you give a good proposal, they award you the proposal, it's that. But they're, again, common for annual increases associated with that. Got it. And, and if, if no one's heard it before, can you define what CPI stands for? Consumer price index. It's basically saying here's, you know, the amount, the the cost of goods have gone up or down over the course of a year. So there are economy factors that can adjust the revenue, and it's a part of the contract built into with what you est establish up front with the city. Correct. Gotcha. Okay, so you know that's the revenue side. I think it's important. You know, we can we can talk all day about all the revenue, but I think it's important to understand at least some 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 good and some bad there. So talk to me a little bit about the actual scheduling of the day, the routing. Like what, what should people be thinking about there um, as they're thinking about this industry? Yeah. And so from the routing standpoint, just like the revenue, which is a monthly service fee, your routing is consistent. So every Monday pretty much repeats itself other than customer additions or, or if you happen to or deletions, but it's consistent. So you're able to plan, I mean, weeks in advance of what your schedule is, you know what you need. There's, there's not a question tomorrow as of what you need because what you needed last last week on that day is basically gonna be, be the same. And the other is mentioned also kind of with the revenue is you determine where you go. And so, you know, it, you don't have to take a location that's, you know, 15 miles from, from your latest stop. And so you're able to determine that, you can determine the service days, uh, and things of that sort. Um, so th that's that's a very very much a pro. I would say really the only con to that is because it is a monthly service fee is holidays. So holidays you can't just skip. So if somebody gets service once a week and you have them set up on a Monday, is you know they're not going to go two weeks without waste service. And so, but but again, with the planning, you plan that out in advance. And sometimes you have to take those holidays. I know there are some people say, I'll just work them. You know, this industry, I'll work them. The issue with the waste industry is if the disposal site's closed, you have no no place to get rid of the waste. And so that somewhat determines the holidays you, you take in this industry. Okay, I, that is, that's helpful for me because I definitely get frustrated when my trash doesn't come when it's supposed to. So I'll just blame it on the disposal site from now on and give some grace to my contractor. Uh, now, yeah, I mean, and for those of you who are used to, you know, DRO or the those types of stop models, uh, you know, this is very nice because you it's like in the same way you have a territory and you know your stops, but everyone needs the trash on a set day every week. So you know exactly where you're going to go. There's no... You know, there's no last minute adjustments where you have to radically change your workforce to cover the different stops because uh, a line haul tractor was delayed the night before. Uh, so you have to make changes at 11, a, uh, 11 p.m. that night. I mean, you know the houses that need trash and they expect it every Tuesday or they expect it every Wednesday. So there's a lot of predictability there in terms of what you are doing during the day. Now, you know, for a lot of people on the FedEx side, they're used to pickups that are within a set window 
if you have something on, let's say, the commercial or the industrial side, is it usually a, a, some kind of contract where you say, I'll be there within a certain period of time after you call or within a certain window during the day? How do you structure those? Yeah, I, I would say the biggest thing you have to take in consideration for that. So if you have a large metropolitan area, you want to hit that early morning hours because you're going to be going through alleys. Again, that's where most most of the dumpsters, containers are. And so, you know, there there are a few instances where you say, hey, I will be here between this time and that time. I will tell you if you're in the residential side, um, you know, the the elderly person that's sitting there that's looking out their window for activity and they're accustomed to seeing you come at 10, at 1030. If you're not there, it's very probable you'll get a phone call asking if we're going to pick up our garbage. Yeah, yeah, I could see that. I mean, I it doesn't even have to be the elderly person. Sometimes I'm sitting outside and I'm like, I, you know, it's it's nine fifteen. Trash comes at nine. I don't know what's going on this morning. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, okay. So, so I think that's good for routing. So, so let's talk a little bit about the fleet. What are the what are the pros and cons for for this industry for the types of trucks and the the things you need to understand around the fleet? Yeah, I think in in this industry you have more flexibility of what you use to service your customers than most other industries. Again, it's not, you know, there's not 20 different, you know, uh, body types for you to use, but there are several different ones. So it's not like if you do residential, you have to use this type of truck. And so the, the other is there are a lot of manufacturers that, that uh, uh, design and build the bodies for the waste trucks. And so it's not like you have one or two to pick from. They have some type of monopoly monopoly on the cost. Uh, and so you do have a large range of options, not only in who the manufacturer is, but the type of body that you use based on your particular service needs. Um, it, the other thing I would say is, again, these trucks are heavy duty. Uh, to me, that that's a that's really a pro to a large degree because if you if you take care of them, they they're gonna run for a while. Yeah. From from a con side on the fleet, I I would say really the the biggest con on the fleet is you're not gonna go down the street and rent a garbage truck. You know they're just not they're not readily available. They are available, but if they are, they're expensive, and and you are gonna need spares because of that. But again, if you have a, a very robust uh, preventive maintenance program on your trucks, that's not a big deal, but you just need to understand. So, so you need to make sure, you know, the maintenance on the trucks is very high priority. Perfect. Now, now I saw a question come in here. Normally, like I said, we do Q and A at the end, but I want to make sure that we address this. So if you haven't been to one of these before and you haven't seen us kind of talk about, you know, an overview of this industry, we do have a few webinars on that, but Tommy, can you just, you know, quickly, is this is this an industry where you're only subcontracting with like waste management or can you talk through how this is a, a you know, a contractor type opportunity there? Yeah, I mean, really, the, the waste industry is is two ways for the most part. One is a municipal contract. And for the most part, those are uh, residential only. So it's only for the houses. There are, there are a few that will throw in the businesses, but it is residential and it's a monthly service fee fee per per the houses that are that are there you send an annual invoice everything else is is business to business for the most part or business to resident um, and so you know there's invoicing there it's monthly for the most part it's monthly service fees um, and and so there is that consistency of who you get and the ability to grow yeah yeah. And, uh, you know, you may see waste management in your city that might be or a, a similar size company might be who delivers to your city. Um, those are subcon. Those are basically the city will bid on those contracts. And and it could be the same person that wins it every time. It could be an independent contractor that wins it the next time. But those are kind of rotating contracts. And then beyond that, every business, every construction site, you know, every type of uh, industry needs some type of trash and it, it looks at a few different ways it may not be purely residential that you know what you may think of when you think of trash but the dumpsters um you know the the different types of uh businesses all have different types of 
kind of waste receptacles. But those are all, like Tommy said, business to business things that you can own on a, on a, on a contractual basis or just on an ongoing basis. So what we're talking about on this webinar is not just subcontracting with waste management. You know, that's there may be opportunities there, but this is more about how you can own in the waste industry in a few different areas. Uh, you know, own all of the inventory and basically you are just picking up the trash, taking it to disposal sites. And we'll talk about disposal in just a second, which is a whole other side of the equation. Um, but this is truly an entrepreneurial contracted type situation, businesses you can buy, businesses you can sell uh, and businesses that you could run indefinitely. And, and Tommy's done uh, those types of businesses and analyzed a bunch, you know, worked on worked for the big players for a while after he got out of owning it himself, kind of looking at running and optimizing these. That's why Tommy's a part of the equation on this end for us too. Yeah, and if I can just add something on that, Josh, just because you see one of the big national companies that you live inside the city limits and they're coming to pick up your waste, the business, the next, the business that's closest to your home, they get to choose who who they want for the most part. And so there are a, a few, there's a handful of large national companies. There are thousands of independents in this industry. Yeah, and and it's a multi-billion-dollar industry. This is this is not just like a you know. There's not just like three players in this space. There are contractors across the country. You wouldn't even realize are doing this every single day at at homes, at businesses, and at things like construction sites as well. Okay, so uh, hopefully that answered your question that came in. If you have any follow up there, like I said, you can you can shoot it in now. We can get to it in the Q and A at the end in, in a little bit as well. So, um, so, so kind of back to thinking about this, you know, I just mentioned it, but can you talk a little bit about the disposal side of the equation? Yeah, it, from a service logistics side on the disposal, it, you know, it, to me, it, it's a pro that you have limited options. Uh, you know, there are only certain sites because of the environmental regulations and compliance. It, it, you know, there's not a disposal site uh, multiple diso disposal sites in every, you know, city, county, you know, around. And so to me, that that limited option, again, is a priority, is, is a pro just because you know and everybody else knows where it's going. So it's also, as they have adjustments, it's also a great opportunity for you to, for you to have an increase, even if it's outside your annual, because... Typically, that information is known somehow, some way. There's something on the news, you know, may just be a blur, but there's some type of written documentation. So it's a great opportunity for you to adjust your rates. Um, and, and then, it, as mentioned earlier, you're paying the same cost as the other folks that are going in there. So, um, you know, that that's very much a... a pro in you know in this a con again i would say limited options is a pro and a con is, is you can't go shop around you know hey you know you can work out some deals with disposal sites based on volume but but it's not like you know you have 20 options you're not going to have 20 options you know i would say in most cases um you're going to have one, two, maybe three options max of where you go. Uh, so, so that's one. The other is again, it's it's a huge part of your overall expenses, and and you have to understand uh, most of most of um, your disposal fees are by weight, and so you need to understand there are different averages of weights a convenience store will throw away you know they have the same size container same service but the weight of a convenience store versus a fast food restaurant versus an office so that but you'll understand that and there's averages there just to make sure you consider that as your pricing yeah that, that's exactly right it's going to affect your margins and so it's really important that you're not just viewing it as a, I offer the same flat rate to every kind of business, every kind of industry, because your expenses won't be flat there, depending on the type of trash that they're disposing, uh, because it's that weight will impact your margins. So that is a, a part of the, the whole kind of pricing equation that you have to take into account. And it's really important for your margins to kind of be something you're always thinking about, especially when it's not just residential, because you can experience wildly different trash from different types of industries when you're talking businesses. 
Um, okay, so let's talk about the other side. So, um, so insurance. What what are the what's the good, the bad when it comes to insurance in this industry? Well, the great thing about the on the insurance side is it is not a specialty type industry where there are only a handful of brokers who you can get insurance from. And so it again, it is there is some aspect of some physical labor, but it's mostly transportation. So you have lots of options. And this is definitely one area where you can go go and shop around. Uh, you know, it, the con, I, I would say, is just you're going to pay when you when you initially get in the industry, you're going to pay based on overall rates you know, what the rates are in the industry. They're just going to be using averages. But the great thing is strong safety program, strong safety record. You know, you're able to move those down in the years ahead. Again, just having a strong program and then seeing the results of those, you can you can have a positive impact reducing those rates. Yeah. And, you know, this is an industry where it's not something where you know you've got someone like fedex telling you the exact types of insurance you need so it's more about what do you think uh, are the best for keeping your business safe um you know where do you want to invest on the insurance side uh and so it's it, it is a choice there and so there's things to think about and work with your insurance broker on the on kind of the best products that uh, fit for you but there's no one saying exactly what you have to have outside of what's legal <laughs> um Okay, so so let's talk to, you know, this is an industry where typically people have some type of facility or, or office space type area. Can you talk about that a little bit as well? Yeah, it, I mean, the pro in this, in this regard is that from a brick and mortar standpoint, if unless you have your own maintenance shop when you get to that size, there's very little brick and mortar needed to run this business. Uh, you know, it can be done as far as invoicing and things of that sort. You don't need a big space. I, I think I told, told Josh, we had an office when we started the business in the basement of our house, and we had a 10 by 12 building for our guys, you know, to check in and out of when we started. That's all we needed. Uh, and so you don't need a whole lot of space, but you are going to need uh, land space in that in that regard for you to park trucks if if you're in the commercial and industrial you're going to need a place to to uh, store your inventory things of that sort it, and i would tell you that it that it is possible to get space from you know somebody that already has it and sub sublet that that space but you also need to understand you know you could also run into a stigma oh, i don't want that you know, I don't, I don't want this on my property, but I can tell you, you know, the biggest way to to combat that is to just have your equipment clean. Show them that, you know, it's not, it's it, it doesn't have to appear to be a nasty business. You know, that's what everybody, so many people think. But if you just keep your trucks clean, uh, you can help combat that, that issue. But I mean... I, Close to my house, going down the other day, a road I go down off, and all of a sudden there's about 15 big industrial containers sitting there on the corner lot. And so I'm sure this guy, you know, it's not paved, it's not graveled, it's just space for him to store containers. Something I don't think I've ever asked you before, uh, how do you wash these large vehicles? you take it somewhere or you just have your guys do it by hand? What's generally the, the way? Yeah, I mean, most of them is just uh, you pressure wash them. For the most part, you just need to be aware again that you're not washing anything that could create an environmental issue as you right. do with any other trucks that you may have related to that. Yeah. It, another thing too, have you ever have you ever seen anybody at a transfer facility or a landfill ever be able to work with them to use space there? Would it ever be worth doing that? Uh, yeah, that that's possible. Uh, it, I would say you're going to have a better chance if the facility is not owned by somebody that's in the transportation, yeah. you know, it, 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 not competing directly with you in that regard. But, you know, transfer stations, landfills, it's very possible you could get some space there as well. Got it. Okay. So just as the last point here before we go to Q&A, can you talk a little bit about the margin side of this business, pros and cons there? Yeah, it, I would tell you definitely a pro is, is that the margins are very healthy in this industry. So a well-run 
uh, waste company should be looking at 15 to 40 percent margins. And I would say, I mean, really 25 plus is, is very common. It's not unusual. Uh, and, and it's kind of funny, the, the con is because it is a very profitable business is if you don't plan for it. If you don't make sure, you know, because um, it, there is capital required in this related to trucks, containers, things of that sort. And so uh, I've seen people that have made great money, but they failed because, again, eventually trucks are going to run out or they couldn't grow because they didn't plan. They didn't have a strategy with this influx of, of um, margins to continue and sustain the business long term. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's I, I think that's a factor for you know any business where anything that you've got that you're making, that's your net income, you've got to make sure that at least some of it's set aside to help plan for the future of the business. And especially if you plan on kind of pushing for any kind of aggressive growth, growth is never free. So uh, you got to make sure that you're, you're thinking about those costs. And, and like you said, those trucks are never, uh, those are not cheap vehicles. <laughs> so um, setting that aside is really important. Okay, so I think that's the main things that I wanted to cover here. We had a few questions that have come through. So, um, so first, uh, you know, you like you said, there's a there's a limit on the number of dump sites that may be available in your area. Does that limit the amount of volume that you can bring? Is that you know, do they ever say this is you know you can't bring any more today, or we can only take X amount per day? Does that ever happen? Uh, that is extremely rare. The the only time you would see something like that would be if it's a municipality and they are about to run out of space. And so, you know, they they could restrict where the waste comes from. But but again, that is that is not the norm. It, that is rare. But is it, you know, again, I guess it goes into there's always exceptions. That would definitely be an exception. Yeah. OK, that makes sense. Yeah. And, and, it, and it goes back to two, especially if you're trying to take it to a landfill. We've talked about this on a few webinars in the past, but. Those landfills are so profitable that they are doing everything in their power to get as much trash as possible into the landfill. So it would be a horrible mismanagement on their part most days if they can't take more trash because they're trying to get as much as they can because their margins are so high. They just want to keep on feeding the monster there. Yeah, I mean, a, a common phrase in the waste industry is feed the beast, and they're referring to, to the landfills. And, you know, and that's it, as you grow and get more volume, it is additional volume that's going to give you the opportunity to, you know, possibly renegotiate some better disposal fees because you've got volume because they want to make sure it keeps coming in. That's right. Um, okay, another question here. Do you ever see people either find any kind of model where they they rent the vehicle first and, and with the anticipation of ultimately buying it? Does any company do that or where you rent it for a month that comes discounted? Or do you see people typically finance these vehicles? Is, you know, either side of that question. Yeah, I mean, people typically finance because there are companies out there that rent these vehicles, uh, but it is very expensive. I can I can tell you it's three or four times what it's going to cost you a month if you finance it. it and so, you know, but but what I do see people do if they're if they're just getting in from the ground floor and starting from scratch is, is they go out and buy used equipment, you know, make sure it's in good working order, do some things associated with that. So the, so they go on the lower end or you know, they get in into an area in the industrial where it's a trailer where you can use a pickup truck. But again, it's going to limit your growth capacity or residential, you know, pickup trucks or, or flatbeds with, you know, um, sides on it. So um, very rarely do I'm, I'm not even aware that's an option to Got actually rent vehicles to get in. OK. Uh, now, now, are all these vehicles diesel? Do you ever see any that aren't diesel in this space? The vast majority of them are diesel when you get into the compaction trucks. Again, because they're uh, have have high, you know, capacity. They need high, be able to move heavy weights, and so um, you, you know. But there are the smaller ones that uh, have have small compaction bodies on them. Again, if you look around, you're going to see a variety of 
all kinds of waste waste trucks close by. I don't care where you're at. Um, and some of those could be on gas. You know, it, it really component of uh, the side of the body you have on it. Have you heard of anybody experimenting with electric yet at all? Has that even touched this industry yet? There, there are some, but it's more as mandated in certain states that are requiring companies to do that. So, uh, and just, just like every other industry, I think the reviews are mixed. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> um, okay, so this last question we have here, can, let's talk a little bit more about the consistency side of the equation. First off, in municipal contracts, can you remind us how often those are bid on? Yeah, typically on municipal contracts, there is a initial term of three to five years, and then there are renewal options. It could be for like terms, or it could be annually, you know, three one-year renewal options at, you know, at the approval of both parties. But typically they're three to five years initially. And, and you will want that just because when you have one, it gives you the chance to, to recoup some of the expense you're going to have in trucks and equipment, things of that sort. Um, but again, there are also, you know, uh, you, I've seen it more, heard of it more since, uh, you know, COVID hit, that there are people that are, you know, going out to rebid or trying to negotiate with somebody because the other person's failing primarily just because of a personnel issue. They, they didn't plan well in that regard. Got it. Now, talk a little bit to, you know, if it's not a municipal contract, I know there's lots of areas that have residential trash that are not governed by a municipality, or at least not a municipal contract. How difficult is it to retain those clients over time? And is it something where you're constantly negotiating? Or what does that look like? No, I would, I would say from from residential, referred to in the industry as subscription service. It's, you know, houses that have to pay for it themselves. Uh, just so I don't forget, typically those are invoiced quarterly in advance as well. So, so that's the way you invoice them. But for the most part, if you do what you say when you say you're going to do it, then you can keep that customer for, for years. Uh, it's, it's not something that a whole lot, but, but also in that side of the business, there's not a whole lot of people that really have a growth plan. It's yeah. just kind of, you know, somebody knows somebody. So if you put together a little strategy for growth, it's it's very possible to get some pretty good growth just by putting out flyers in areas you want to go or, or offering some type of incentive to your guys that are in an area you want to get some more density to. So um, that's one of the things in the industry. It's kind of like, oh, this is what I've got. And they just have, have no growth plan at all. Yeah. And, and I think that's a, a big, important point here is that, the, and it's, it's the same way a lot of these industries are that were looked at, same way FedEx was a while, you know, about 10, 15 years ago. A lot of people are not focused on how to make this, you know, a sustainable long-term business. They're focused on operating what they've got. Um, either can work. You can be just fine operating, you know, what you take on, but there's a lot of opportunity here uh, for somebody who has business savvy or puts together the right growth plan and strategy to continue to add on to what you start with, whether it's residential or commercial or industrial, there's different parts of that equation, but you know, all of those are parts that you can incorporate and bring into an existing business if you plan for it right and are doing, you know, doing it in a way that's still profitable and, and kind of hits those margins we've talked about. Yeah, I, I do wanna make sure I'm clear on something. That commercial and industrial, there are agreements that they typically have. Uh, Again, because you've got they've got an asset sitting on that person's property, unless it's the construction side. <clears throat> so, you know, construction is is referred to as temporary business because again, most of the most of the business in this industry is is what they call permanent, and that's how they think of it. It's going to you know month after month go on and on, uh, and so there are agreements there. Uh, again, just to protect the assets they've got on the property. And, and to do that, but in the industrial side, it's very wide open. I mean, construction side. Yep. Perfect. All right. I think that's all the questions that we have time for today. So um, just as a reminder, if you, oh, we just had one come in quickly. Um, 
so yeah, Ben, if you have questions and want to kind of dive into anything in particular or specific uh, instance, you can reach out to info at routeconsultant.com and just mention my name and connect and we'll, we can have a separate conversation there. Um, it, the, the thing about this space is, you know, there's residential, commercial, industrial, there's, a, there's a bunch of different things to think about. And depending on the specific questions you have, we might go in different directions. So yes, you can reach out to me directly there. We just put it in the chat as the email. Um, we also have a waste 101 that's live, that's free on our webpage. And we have a few other ways that you'll be able to continue to learn and dig into this space and work with our team and Tommy is it, whether it's something where you're trying to uh, build your own in this space or buy an existing business, uh, lots of different ways we can help you there. So whatever your questions are, best place is info at routeconsultant.com and we can go from there and help you find it. Uh, so again, Tommy, thank you so much for being here uh, and for answering questions. It's always a pleasure to have you. Thank you. Enjoy it. Yeah. And thanks everybody for joining. We will see you next week. We have these every Thursday at the same time. So if you're looking for more, we will be here next week as well. Thanks everybody. See you next week.